our schools were named Booker T. Washington across the country. At Booker T. Washington, we were taught that you have to be 10 times better than white people in order to make it in America. How many of you were taught that kind of philosophy? Remember those days? You that can't raise your hand, you probably don't believe you have to be better than anybody <laughs> to make it, if you could just be equal somehow. But we were told you had to be 10 times better to be successful. And of course, our generation, uh, we have a certain tenacity for uh, being better at whatever we do. Booker T. Washington also uh, was known to have at least 90% of all the graduates went to college. No exceptions. Year after year after year from the inception of Booker T. Washington, which at the, its inception was a one-room school. From that point to this point, uh, I shouldn't say to this point, but to the point of integration, it was 90% went to college. After integration, it was reversed. 90% do not go to college, only 10% go. And you probably are noticing that same type of phenomenon taking place in New Orleans. It certainly is happening in every city across the country. It is now a statistical report that 50% of all so-called black students are dropping out of school in every city in the country. 50%. That means they are out of school by the time they are 14, 13, 14, whatever, just hanging out in the street, selling drugs, doing those things that we know about gang activity. It's not getting any better. Even America is known to have dropped down to number 19 in comparison to the industrialized world in science, math, etc. Can you imagine a white teacher standing up saying, all of you little black kids out there in this classroom, you're going to have to be 10 times better than me and all these white kids in this classroom. Can you imagine such taking place today? Of course not. What would happen to her? She would get fired. So we don't have to wonder about a black teacher having nerve to say that in an integrated classroom. That's out of the question, isn't it? It certainly is. I looked around. And of course, I always thought being rich was a nice thing. I never did have a thing against being rich. I heard all the negative stories about being rich, like, uh, how you doing? Fairly middling. Uh, how much money would you like to make if you could just make any amount? Well, just enough. Well, what's enough? You know, enough to get by. How many heard our people talk like that? You heard it? I'd rather have a, a poor man's sleep than a rich man's problems. How many heard that kind of talk? <laughs> Everybody, I mean, this was serious brainwashing, wasn't it? Somebody, see, you're in New Orleans and heard it. I heard it in Oklahoma and in New York and Chicago, everywhere I go in the country, my people have heard this same story. And it just goes on and on and on about how wonderful it is to be in poverty. You know, I even heard them use the Bible to try to keep you in poverty. Only the poor, the meek, and the humble is going to go to heaven. It's harder for a rich man to go to heaven than a camel to crawl through a needle's eye. <laughs> yeah, the Bible is saying that, but how many heard it? It tells you don't even try to be rich because you'll never crawl through a needle's eye, right? <laughs> I can repeat more, and you could probably tell me many more yourself. All of these stories are designed to teach us something that's wrong with money, that you shouldn't love money, right? Or you shouldn't like money, or that there's just something wrong with money. Money is the root of all evil. <laughs> How many heard of that? You heard it? You say, let me be evil. <laughs> that's what a lot of people, I'll just be evil then. <laughs> And they lay that story on the Bible. And the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not evil. But my people, we so used to being poor till we just go ahead and make it evil. <laughs> These are all designed to keep us in poverty. 
and to never look up and study and learn or seek how to be rich. My question is, what's the purpose of school? If school does not teach us how to be rich, what in the world is school about? If school doesn't teach us how to move from a negative position to a positive position, what is school about? If school does not teach us how to balance a checkbook, how to open up a checking account, and how to, to have home economics where you take your money and, and know what to do with it, what percentage of your earnings should go to a house or to rent, and what percentage should go for food and clothing and, and the necessities of life, and what percentage should be saved. I don't know about you, but I wasn't taught any of that. Were you? You were not either. Well, then what's school about? What in the world did we go to school for? If school does not teach us how to rule the world, or rule America, or rule our county, or parish, or city, what is school for? What in the world are we sitting in the classroom or sending our children to get a good education and they don't know what politics is? Can't spell it? Don't know how to win? We lose at politics all the time. Even when we win an office, we still lose. The, the masses always seem to lose. Why don't we know how to take advantage of politics from the school classroom? Why don't we know how to get in from the grassroots level and end up uh, in the electoral college? What in the world is school about? If it doesn't teach us how to be first class, high class, society itself, what do we go for? We're not taught to ask that question. Isn't it interesting? It's an interesting question. Why is it that when we go to school in an integrated sense, the white kids come out with one idea, hiring you after they hire themselves. <laughs> hmm? What do you come out of school with? What idea? Get a what? Go on and say it, get a job. <laughs> it's all right to tell the truth. You come out looking for a job. I have a question. How many of you have discovered in your life nobody gets rich working on a job? <laughs> you ever found that out? Yes. See, it's designed for the worker to never get rich. The only one who's going to get rich in a society like America is a capitalist. Why aren't you taught capitalism? You would be competition, wouldn't you? If you learned how to do something other than a job, you'd be competition, wouldn't you? So you get the idea what school is about now? It's to keep you blind, deaf, dumb, ignorant, and dead, down, in poverty, negative. If I wasn't black, I could make it. How many have me? <laughs> you heard people use that one? If I had, if I had just been born in another neighborhood. <laughs> hey? Boy, if I had straight hair. Mm -hmm. If I could just get my head a blow <laughs> in the breeze and shake it, <laughs> I could really move up. <laughs> What's wrong with the public school? Public school is designed for public people to remain public. <laughs> 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 no exceptions to the rule. But in my little odyssey, I asked uh, my teachers, well, what are the keys to move from poverty to riches? And you know what my teachers told me? They told me what I'm sure they told you, if you ask the question. It's at college. How many heard that, that the key to get out the ghetto and get more is definitely at college? You heard it? My teachers told me that. I looked at my teachers. All of them, no exceptions, the principal and all, and I saw that they hadn't really moved from poverty to riches. They were better off than some people, but they hadn't moved from poverty to riches. 
Do you know what I came, the conclusion I came to? Is that when the keys were given out at college, they were on vacation. <laughs> because they didn't have them. So they, they must have been somewhere else when the keys to poverty and riches were given out. But anyway, I bought the store because everybody else was buying it. I was among that 90% that went to college, so I went. And I went to Texas College, majored in math and music. And I looked around on my campus. I didn't see a professor that had moved from poverty to riches. None of the students had moved from poverty to riches. So before I could you know, pursue it further, I got this wonderful letter from the United States government. Can you imagine the United States government being interested in me, a freshman? <laughs> yeah, they were interested. They, they sent me a beautiful letter from the United States government, greeting. You sisters don't know what I'm talking about, so y'all don't get these kind of letters. But, but brother, some of us brothers got letters. How many have ever gotten a letter like that from the government? It said, greetings. You are invited to come and die in Korea. <laughs> now, some of my relatives own funeral homes, and I've never seen a dead fella get up and move from nowhere to nowhere. Everybody had to move the dead wherever they went. So I wasn't about to die for no country. I hadn't found the keys to riches yet. <laughs> you know, I have to have some of that before we talk about dying. <laughs> I want to at least be in heaven twice. <laughs> On earth, and if there's another one, I'm going there too. <laughs> but how many heard you, you go to heaven after you die? You know, you, all the riches and all the pie and the honey and the milk, all that stuff come after death in Beulah's land. So I'm, I, no, I just couldn't buy none of that. So I looked around, I found out the Navy wasn't for me because ships get blown out the water and people drown way out there in the middle of the ocean. So I couldn't join no Navy. And the Army was the one sent me that letter and I knew I didn't want to be a paratrooper jumping out of no airplane like I was a bird, <laughs> break your leg, your neck, and get shot out the air. Then the Marines, they were just crazy. You know, they just run at a hill, people shooting at them, they don't have nothing. They just, ah, they just die like flies. I knew the Marines were not for me. <laughs> so I didn't have one choice left. What was that? Air Force. Air Force, right. But I wasn't flying no plane. <laughs> they get shot out the sky, they crash, and didn't want to work on one because they uh, might get blown up just for being a mechanic. <laughs> so since I majored in math, I became a math teacher in the Air Force and a tactical instructor. You know what a tactical instructor is? That's one who trained troops. So what I did was train white boys to be patriotic so they could die for their country. <laughs> you see, I understood well that wasn't nobody in Korea had ever called me nigger. <laughs> nobody could convince me to go shoot some brown folk who hadn't done nothing to me. And they were talking about kill your enemy. So we're not going to get off into all that, but I didn't buy none of that garbage. I joined, and I looked around, and I saw men that retired after 20 years, 30 years. They died five years later. Not one had moved from poverty to riches. I checked out the offices. No need of me going to Officers Canada School because I didn't see any officers getting rich. Today, you might have a few get rich, like Oliver North, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Learn how to use a shredder machine. <laughs> and it confessed to being an open liar, you know. <laughs> Dealing drugs, that's what he was doing. <laughs> But I saw that wasn't the way to go, so I simply, uh, I lost a lot of weight. Y'all excuse my pants, will you? I went on a 21-day fast and came off on October 7th, and I don't want to gain it back, but I'm going to have to have my pants taken up. I can see, see that's what's happening. <laughs> so I got out of the military, took advantage of the GI Bill with the Phillips University, a school that had turned me down before I went in the military because we were so-called black students, whatever. But they accepted me by the time I got out of the military, got out a year early, and I majored in social science. I took a degree then in that area. Looked around the college campus, no one had moved from poverty to riches, none of the students. So I decided, well, maybe it's at law school. So I went to the University of Oklahoma Law School. And the dean of the law school came out on freshman orientation day, and he said, unless you're willing to be unethical, unless you're willing to be somewhat crooked, unless you're willing to deal with a lot of crooks, then law school is not for you. 30% of the students got up and just walked out. They couldn't stand that idea. 
Well, nevertheless, I didn't want to do what was required to be a lawyer. So then I went to Atlanta University, took a degree in, uh, a master's degree in economics. There I was distressed again. At Atlanta University, none of my professors had moved from poverty to riches, didn't have the keys. Three of my professors were white. They had old cars, run over shoes, living in deteriorated uh, faculty housing. None of them had moved from poverty to riches. They were trying to get me to go to Harvard, Princeton, and Yale to, to uh, further my studies in law, uh, uh, in economics, excuse me. And I didn't see where they had improved themselves with a doctorate degree. They teach in theory. You know what was shocking? Not a college professor in economics and those who taught me business had ever owned a business. Wow. Can you believe that? Masters and doctorate degrees teaching students economics and business and business administration and never owned a business in their life? Isn't that something? And what was even worse, not one of my professors and I found it to be true on all the campuses. None of them run a business, had never run a business. So they couldn't teach me how to own one, open up one, finance one, run one, sustain one, keep it going. You know, these things, if you go into business, it's called hard knocks, isn't it? I mean, you go out, you hit, you miss, you, you fail a little, you fail a lot, really. Then one day you get lucky and make it. <laughs> if you live long enough. And then it's called, how do you keep it? And then your kids will be going all kind of different directions from you. So you get all this money, your kid want new cars, they want all the stuff, they want to go to college and not study, huh? And then they don't want to be in the business you're in. They want to be a dog catcher or a veterinarian or something. <laughs> you know, Jews are different. They, they, they have their program together. But I discovered that none of these institutions gave out the keys on how to move from poverty to riches. So then I checked out religion. Of course, I was born in the church. Father's a pastor of churches even to this day. He's 76 years old. He does quite well preaching. My mother is 73 years old, both enjoying good health. Uh, of course, he didn't give me any keys either. But I checked out all the religions. Some of them teach the eightfold path. Y'all heard about that? Teaches eight paths to travel. I checked people going out all eight paths, and none of them had moved from poverty to riches. Then they wanted me to put on a chiffon robe, go barefoot, shave my head, take a bowl, and walk around and beg for my food. Now, I could be homeless and do that. <laughs> so I, I know that wasn't the way to go. And, and I checked out other religions, and it was a hierarchy. All of them were doing quite well. The masses and the believers, you know, those who supported the religion, they didn't do too well. And none of those at the top were giving up any keys. Then I came back up on the, on the, on the set of bishops one day and uh, caught, caught several of them in a room. And I said, Bish, I got a few questions. Yes, son. I just want to know, do, do any of you really know God? Yes! Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> I met him early one morning. <laughs> About 3 o'clock, <laughs> you know, they went on. I said, holy, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just want to know, do you really know him? I know him, have known him personally. <laughs> My man, I'm his man, God's man. I said, you really are? I said, yes, sir. I said, well, I just want to know, can you give me the keys to move from poverty to riches? They gave me all kind of little things, like if I serve the church well and serve them well and, like, literally be a valet and, Etc. you know, that they'll give me some churches if I serve enough years, and, and it went on and on, but nobody was giving up keys. But they were steady telling me they were God's man. I said, you really know him, know him personally? I'm telling you, I know him personally. I said, I said well, I'll tell you what I want you to do, bitch. Would y'all please give me the Lord's address so I can go meet him myself, and maybe he'll give me the keys. <laughs> You know what happened to me, don't you? They kicked me out. I was kicked out for just wanting to know where the Lord lived. <laughs> they were taking up his money. So I figured they were doing so well because they were taking the Lord his money. They just didn't want none of us to know where the Lord lived so they could get all the blessings. 
<laughs> they kept taking up the money, but they didn't let nobody follow them to the Lord. <laughs> oh, you have to, it, it, you just have to face it. That's the real world. So I began to wander around. Then one day, I met a man. This man taught me how to move from poverty to riches. He taught me how to take nothing and make something. He taught me all the, the secrets about life, how to live forever, how to in, improve your health, heal yourself. And he, he told me to share those keys with those who are seeking and desiring to make a difference in their lives and the lives of our people. And that man's name is Yahweh. That's his name. Praise Yahweh. So who is Yahweh? Yahweh is a name that you should know because it's the duty of the Son of God to proclaim his Father's name. And here you have a whole bunch of people going to church, 400,000 churches, and they don't know the name of the Father. They say such silly things like, Father, God, help me. Both of them titles. Father is a title, God is a title. Who's going to answer to that? The purpose of the coming of the Son is to reveal the name of the Father. That's who he prayed to, our Father, and he called his name. He said, hallowed be, holy be thy name. How can it be holy to you when you don't know it? Interesting, isn't it? There are a lot more interesting questions than that about that situation. But when you begin to read your Bible, as I call this to your attention, you will discover from the Old Testament of Genesis all the way through Revelation, it's all about the name of the Father. It's all about his name. But somebody got you calling some other kind of name other than the Father's name. And you don't know his name. And unless you learn his name, then you're never going to move from poverty to riches. And if you don't come into the knowledge of the name. Haven't you ever wondered why it is that you have the same God, have the same churches, and the same name that white people have? I mean, if you know that you do, our people have the same, right? But isn't it strange how God always answers white people's prayers? And <laughs> Black folks' prayers don't seem to be the same magnitude. You know, you say, well, I get my prayers answered, but why don't you ever get answered to be the ruler? <laughs> I mean, you, you know, my people are always on their knees in front of white people asking white people to let them be accepted. Why do you need to ask white people for acceptance? Why don't you just ask God? Doesn't your God have enough power to make you accepted? Why can't you be the people that everybody else wants to be among? Why are you always running after somebody else to be among them? What's wrong with your God? Why do you have to go around always on your knees with your hat in your hand begging for a job from white people? Why don't your God just give you some jobs? Oh, I have to ask you some serious questions because white people move from poverty to riches every day. Huh? They come from Russia. They come from Europe. They come from England. They come from all over the world with nothing on the ship. Come and get in your neighborhood. Come with a buggy and a basket and a wagon and push it around in your neighborhood and move from poverty to riches out of your pocket. You live in the neighborhood and stay poor and just pray all the time. You prayed enough to rule all the world. Oh, I'm not putting you down. I'm just telling you, you need to have some knowledge of how to move. And the God that you've been praying to uh, favors white people. You, have you ever noticed, see, white people can beat you over high and throw you in jail and just walk up and say, citizens arrest. <laughs> right? And when you see a white boy doing something wrong, why don't you walk up and say, citizens arrest. I'm arresting you, boy. 
You're scared. Why, why does your God let you be scared to do that? <laughs> huh? I mean, you should be without fear. <coughs> Something to think about? The same reason you can't answer these questions is the reason why you haven't been able to move from poverty to riches and keep it. Why can't you tax? They levy taxes. Why can't you tax? Why don't you print money? Why is your, when you open up a printing press, it's counterfeit? <laughs> <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, this is heavy, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So what's school all about? That's my original question. If school doesn't answer all these questions, and the church doesn't answer all these questions, you need a new teacher. You need somebody who has moved from nothing to something and come back and show you how to do it, don't you? Because you don't get it through any other source. And that is for sure. So who is Yahweh? Yahweh is the God of the Bible. He's the God of the Hebrews. In the beginning, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth. Yahweh is the man that beat up on Pharaoh. Y'all remember how he put plagues in Egypt? That was Yahweh did that. Yahweh is the one that when Pharaoh got real sassy, he drowned him in the Red Sea. <laughs> That's Yahweh who did it. Yahweh is the man that when Daniel refused to bow down to another nation and quit facing the east and praying, when he refused to stop praying to his God, which was Yahweh, they said, well, we're going to put you in the lion's den and starve them. Threw him in the lion's den. Yahweh locked the law, the jaw. Lions could do him no harm. Rulers got scared. Came and got Daniel out and made him a ruler. <laughs> right? I just want you to know who Yahweh is. He made the sun, the moon, and the stars, all what you see and haven't seen. Okay. So who is Yahweh then Yahweh? I am his son. I am his son. That's who I am. I am the son of Yahweh. I don't care who else is the son or who else is else. I, it makes me no difference. I'm not here tonight concerning myself with who is the son of who. I'm the son of Yahweh. I have to tell you who I am. Yahweh is my father. I am his son. What makes me his son? What makes me Yahweh's son is I do not have a will outside of his. I have no thoughts, no ideas, and no program outside of Yahweh. You'll find that all that I ever do, all that I've ever done, and all that I'm ever going to do is found right in the Bible and is traced right to his will. No exception. I take no credit for all that I have built. It's all in his name. You hate Wafi. That's one of the things that make me his son. Also, I have no difference in his word. I only speak his words. <coughs> Even the words I've spoken to you thus far, the principles of those words are all in the Bible. Every single one of them is found in the Bible. No exception. So I walk as he says walk. I talk as he says talk. I act as he says act. I do whatever he says do. I have no idea of doing it any other way. Those are the things that makes me his son. I obey his laws, his statutes, his judgments, his commandments. That's why I'm successful. He said in his holy word that if I obey his law, statutes, judgments, and commandments, that he would make everything, all the works of my hands, would prosper. So all the works of my hands, it's prospering. I'm telling you why. Now, what about you? You might say, well, if you're the son of Yahweh, can I be? Of course you can. Of course you can be the sons of Yahweh. Every one of you can be. Every one of you can be the daughters of Yahweh. All you have to do is like I do. Obey his will, just like I do. You automatically become. You believe on his name, then you have eternal life. There's no other name under heaven that you can be saved in other than God who created it. You can't be saved in no name but the name of the one who created everything. And he gave his son a name higher than all the angels in heaven. What's the name higher than all the names that, that the angels could possibly have? The father's name. There can be no name higher than the creator's. So the son has to come in his father's name. Just like if your name is David, then your father was named David. If your name is Smith, your father's name was Smith. My name is Yahweh, so my father's name is Yahweh. That's logical. 
Okay. So that tells you a little bit about who I am. I'm one who obeys the will of my father, who is Yahweh. That makes me his son. Now you found out you don't really have to be jealous of me. I'm just the firstborn. That's all. I'm, I'm born into the knowledge of Yahweh before you. Now I've come to share that knowledge with you so you can move from poverty to riches. If you like it from this side to that side, from poverty to riches, whichever way you like to get it, from right to left or left to right. Who are the Hebrew Israelites? They're the ones who follow what I teach. So that brings me to the dramatic question, who are you? Who are you? Big question. I said, who are you? you. That's what some people know. But there are some people in here that may still be colored. <laughs> How many colored people in here tonight? No colored people tonight. How many remember the colored days? <laughs> Weren't those the great days? I mean, colored days were wonderful days. They was fabulous. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you said, what in the world can he, what does he mean? Color was great. Sure, we had things named after us when we were colored. We had, used to have colored town. <laughs> after we gave up being colored, they took our town from us. <laughs> we don't have colored town nor anymore. <laughs> colored waiting room. <laughs> See, wasn't that something? I mean, white folk, Indians, Chinese, all those folk couldn't sit down on our toilet. And we weren't known to have so much AIDS and stuff, but in that time, I mean, all these other people just couldn't put their stinky breath on our water fountain. We had a special water fountain just for us colored folks. <laughs> we had it made. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, yeah we, we were big time. We even had organizations named after us all over the world knew about us. National Association for the Advancement of Colored people. <laughs> we, was, we were somebody special, weren't we? And when we got ready to go out of the country, say, well, what's your nationality? What would we say? Color. <laughs> so what was on our job was like, the big C. <laughs> that was something special, wasn't it? The big C. Then I began to go around the country, and I asked the think tank leaders, all the intelligentsia, I asked them a the question. Well, do you speak colored East? You know, Japanese speak Japanese. Spanish speak Spanish. German speak German. So I, I know I was asking a good question. It made sense to me. Everybody else spoke a language after themselves, right? Russian spoke Russian. So I don't know, do you speak colored East? <laughs> they, they laugh too. They say, no. What's wrong with you, boy? <laughs> I say, well, I'm, I'm not through. I just have another question. Do you have a colored name? You know, Japanese had Japanese names. Chinese had Chap Chinese, you know, Chinese names. Yeah. Russian had Russian names. You know the names. Gorbachev for Russian, right? Pierre for French. Kawasaki for Japanese, right? <laughs> Etc. But my people were saying they were colored, but they didn't have colored names. So I have one more question for all you colored folks. Is there a mouth? that says colored land. And they laughed again and said no. But the Japanese had Japan. The Chinese had China. The Spanish had Spain. Right? The Cubans had Cuba. Why we couldn't have something? We were the only ones cut off. I, what we called ourselves, or they called us, you know, we, it couldn't take us back to anything. And that kind of made us in an unequal position, didn't it? Because everybody in America, every single child in the public school of America, they knew their history, their culture, their language, their name, their land, their God. They had an attachment, and they all moved from poverty to riches. They had the opportunity. But here we sat in the classroom. We didn't have any of that. So my people decided to think tanks. said, well, we better not be colored no more. He asked us a severe question. So they went and got a map, and they looked in Africa, and they saw Niger River. Niger. They said, that's too close to being a nigger. If they put a G in that, that'd be nigger, you know, nigger river. <laughs> so, <laughs> they already called niggers, so they didn't, want, they, didn't want, they didn't want to be no niggers. But what they ended up with was Negro. 
And that was a strange word. It's really a Greek word. It used to be nekros, N-E-K-R-O. That meant something dead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they dropped the K, and white folks made us Negroes. How many remember Negro Day? <laughs> remember Negro Day? And what was on our driver's license? The big N. <laughs> that could have been nigger too, couldn't it? Yeah. The great big N. So again, I went around America, just like I'm doing now, and I asked all of the uh, think tank leaders, do you speak Negro East? No. Do you have a Negro name? No. Is that Negro land? No. <sighs> so they were in hot trouble again. Think tank. In the meantime, some of our brothers, they went over, well, they went through another state before they did that. They said, well, some people began to sing a song. And they said, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Just open the door. You heard it. I'll get it myself. Then he began to sing another song. I'm black and I'm proud. I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Say it again. I'm black and I'm proud. Yeah, right? <laughs> we were proud in those days, weren't we? What's your nationality? Black, can't you tell? I'm black and I'm proud. Black is beautiful. How many heard black is beautiful? How many heard black power? We went for that until we found we had no green power. So since we didn't speak black East, didn't have no black names, and didn't have no black land, you know, we just decided we'd give that up to some of the brothers. They came up with an idea, and they came out with a, a pick. What was that pick for? Afro. Afro. <laughs> so we began, how many remember the Afro days? Hair all out like that, right? We had a pick, pick, <laughs> fluffed it all out. You ever wear one? I wore one. <laughs> had a dashiki. How many ever wore a dashiki? Yeah, I, I wore one, you know, a little short thing. Then some of our people went to Africa. Some of our people went to Africa. Guess what they found out? Nobody, nobody but nobody wore Afro in Africa. <laughs> went from one in Africa to the other, and there wasn't one wearing an Afro. And that wasn't all. None of them were wearing a dashiki. Not one more dashiki. So they came back to America, spread the word, they looked on the Afro pick, found out it was made in Hong Kong. <laughs> so the brothers just gave the Afro up. What'd they do then? They went and sat in the beauty parlor, pushed the woman out, made all their hair long, curly perms and stuff. Remember the curly perms, the brothers? That long stuff hanging out, right? They couldn't go for Afro-American because there was no, you, you know you don't speak Afro and have an Afro name, so. But they were trying to get it together. So just two years ago, they got it together. All the intelligence that came together again. Black thing, because I'm the one keep running around asking these questions. And I know when you ask it among the intelligentsia, it kind of filters down. So I don't have to go to the masses. I just go to those few who are the intelligent ones, who sit around in a group. They meet once a year, sit around in a group. They call them think tanks. And they think up all this stuff that you end up becoming. You know? used to be colored, then you became Negro, then you became black. So they came up, this time it's supposed to be the panacea. Because you have Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, French Americans, German Americans. So they say, well, we're supposed to be from Africa, so let's become what? <laughs> African Americans. How many remember? That's what's going on today. That's the latest thing. African Americans. How many African Americans in here tonight? Y'all scared to be one, huh? <laughs> 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 yeah, I have your paranoia now, don't I? <laughs> but they figured this was the answer to my question. Africans, they said, yeah, we're going to get this Yahweh being Yahweh this time. Let him come back around asking this, these questions. So I said, well, okay, okay. I'm brave. I'm going to ask you the question. I sure have some for you. I want to know how many of you speak African? <laughs> Nobody. See, nobody on that continent speaks African. Y'all didn't know that? Yeah. They speak tribal language. Swahili is a tribal language. Mandela speaks Bantu. That's his tribal language. He's a Bantu. And each one speaks his own tribal language, which identifies his land, the piece of the continent that his family owns. And they all have a piece, 
according to their language. So. But nobody speaks African. So they looked at me kind of hard that time. So we waiting on you to ask that next one. <laughs> Just come on and ask me. I said, all right. Do you have an African name? Yes, Mandela, Nkrumah, <laughs> Sikho Turi. <laughs> Say, you, you better go seek a tour because you're lying. <laughs> no, that, those, are not, those are not African names. Those are tribal names. So they really got they really got ready for me this time. You bring that map up. You bring that. How dare you? Come on, y'all, we've been y'all. You bring up that map. <laughs> Tell me that there's no map now with African on it. <laughs> what you got to say about that? I say plenty. I have two real serious questions about that. So they got real real festy. Festy. Yeah. Come on then. All right. How long has the continent? been called Africa. Why are there no ancient maps with the name Africa on it? The continent did not used to be called Africa. So how long ago? Mm. The think tank didn't want to deal with that. They couldn't deal with it. I have another question too. Since, since the name was changed to Africa, I want to know from you who changed it. And I'm here to say the same one that changed your name to Smith and Underwood and Greenleaf, Mr. Brown, Overtree and Underwood. <laughs> you know who that is. So that leaves you not really knowing your true history. You're outside the domain of your true history in knowing who you are. And I'll share with you a common experience that I have and many of my disciples have had, and that is in dressing like this and going through airports, uh, that's the way I go, uh, inevitably there are white people that come up every single day. Even some came up today. I was on the roof of this building and a white woman came over and they, they want to know, uh, where are you from? I say, Israel. Oh, really? <laughs> Israel. Oh, how interesting. Well, what's your nationality? Well, you would normally think if I'm from Israel that you would figure it out, right? So then she said, well, and they all asked the same question. Well, what's your nationality? Hebrew Israelite. Is that Jewish? <laughs> I didn't say that. How do, how do they connect that with being Jewish? But they always want to know, is that Jewish? And I never say no, I never say yes. I simply say, I repeat what I said. I meant what I said. I am Hebrew Israelite. We are Hebrew Israelites. Oh, I see. I see. Well, well, well what, what's that name? I never said it's a name. <laughs> I'm sitting out there t on the roof, tending to my business in the airport, they, but they all of a sudden know this is a name. checking me out, right? And I answer, it's the name of God in Hebrew, Yahweh. And then they'll say things like, oh, I know. That meant they were checking me out to see if I know what I'm wearing. And when I let them know I know what I'm wearing, they always say, I know. So I ask them, okay, it's my turn now. Well, when did you learn, since you know? When did you learn this is the name of God? They said, oh, our parents teach us that when we were little, like three or four years old. I said, well, do you tell me? I said, well, no. And then I, one, one day at the airport, I, one was going through this ritual, and he, he knew all about it and, and said, I, I know you God's chosen people. You've chosen to rule the world forever. Our people know that. We taught his children. They went through this whole thing. And so I saw a couple of brothers coming through the airport, and I flagged them over. And they saw me talking to white people, so they came right over. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
know how that is. So I said, tell these brothers right here what you were telling me. Tell them what? <laughs> I mean, look real puzzled, you know, like making me look funny in front of the brothers. I said, well, you know that, that, they, that these brothers right here are chosen to rule the world forever. Rule what? <laughs> like they had a death problem. They said, you know, that you said also that, you know, Yahweh, you were taught that Yahweh is God. You said, Jehovah? What? What? <laughs> so I saw, you know, that was futile, futile. So I said, okay, brother, you all can go ahead. And I asked him, well, why did you do that? They said, because that's not my job to teach them. That's, that's the Messiah's job. I'm no Messiah. That's somebody, that's somebody from your people got to teach them that. That's not my job. So even you sitting here, you can go and, and express that you know this, and your best white friend will tell you they know it too. And then, then you ask them, well, why didn't you tell me? And they'll tell you why they didn't tell you. Not their job to tell you. They told not to tell. They'll never rule over you if they tell. And they lose their rulership the moment you know. So they're not going to tell you and lose it. Because when you know your God, then he's the only one that can deliver you. He's the only one that can move you from poverty to riches. Nobody else's God has ever moved you. we tried every one of them. <laughs> Haven't we? I mean, you name it, we try. we'll try voodoo, hoodoo, ubu, obu, kubu. We'll try broccoli and, and anything else that you want to make a God. <laughs> we will. We'll try gooba dust. We'll wear stuff all around our neck, chain it around our waist, stinky garlic and all kind of stuff, all kind of hands. Go put goober dust in people's bed and have people be sprinkling stinky stuff behind your sofa, <laughs> breaking eggs on your porch. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? I mean, people be running around trying to steal some of your hair. You can't let them clean up your house. They be taking your underwear to folk. <laughs> <laughs> taking their socks. I mean, it, am I right? I mean, there's some strange niggas in this world. <laughs> they try it all. They burn candles on you. Give up your license tag, and you better not have a flat. I told you, stuff works. <laughs> See that flat tie? Shoot. And if it really worked, all niggas would be rich, just about. Because all of us have tried some of that stuff, haven't we? Come on, tell the truth. How many tried a little something? <laughs> you don't want to fess up in here, I know. <laughs> Go use some kind of root or something. In the meantime, the things that we do keep us from moving from poverty to riches when the knowledge we need is never taught to us. All other nations know their history, culture, language, name, land, and most of them made up their own gods. But I'm dealing with a group of people who have been robbed of the knowledge of their god, history, culture, language, name, and land. And until I get the so-called black man of America back on track, then America will never prosper. And when I teach the so-called black man of America how to move from poverty to riches, as other nations have already demonstrated, then America is going to prosper. How many of you noticed that America is going down? You noticed it? Have you noticed that the jobs are drying up? You notice SNLs are going out? You heard about that? How many know that at least 200 banks fail every year now? You're going to run out of banks to fail after a while. As many as 45,000 people are losing their jobs at a time. Big airlines are closing down right and left. Where are these people going? Where are they? No new plants are opening. You used to make tennis shoes in America. Nike and Reeboks, all those things are made in Hong Kong and Korea. And your automobiles are being made in Japan and other places. If they don't, if the Japanese didn't come in and put money in America, it would be already down the tube. So seeing that it's going down the tube, there's another reason. There are 60 million so-called black people in America, and we're all dependent on white people. 
So the name of the game is to pay you as little as possible so they can make as much as possible. Huh? Then we try to live like them. <laughs> Don't we? I mean, we, we try to fake it while they make it. <laughs> we owe everybody. We owe. <laughs> Do you know that most black folk are just three paychecks from living under the bridge? <laughs> In the jungle, on the street. Some folk, most poor folk, are seem to be one or two paychecks from it. Three is really something. You got three, you mean you can stay three paychecks before you go outdoors? If you're not outdoors, it's just cause white folk, you know, have mercy, right? They, they just want to keep getting something. But frankly, we are already living whatever we earn up to the hill. Bad shape America's in. 60 million black folk as dependents. It's not gonna work very much longer because the Bible depicts you as the prodigal son. Are you really going to sit around in America until all your wealth that your father has given you is gone? Is you wasted on wine, women, and song? Are you really going to do that? Are you really going to end up in the pig pen with the pigs? Even the pigs left the prodigal son. They ate all the corn, left the nigga the husk. <laughs> Then the pig left. <laughs> Read your Bible. Yes, sir. Are you gonna, is that when your memory is gonna come back? That's when he came back. He woke up in a pig pen with everything gone. Then he said, now I remember my father. Then they, then they called him, he was lost. When he was in that mental condition, he also tried to become a citizen of that strange land that wasn't his. How many of us see black folk in America trying to be a citizen in America? Yeah. You've never gotten that thing corrected on the, on the Constitution yet that left you three-fifths human. Never been corrected. That's why you're the only people in America that needs a civil rights bill, a voting rights bill, an affirmative action bill, and all those other kind of bills. Nobody else come to America need those bills. You've never figured out why you need bills. Bush just so you niggas don't need no bill. <laughs> I'm not fixing to let you be hired on no quota. You know what he said? He said you ought to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. They even had somebody on Jesse Jackson's program I heard this week. David Duke, David Duke and some of these folks, they were on their arguing Saturday night. Did y'all, some of y'all see that? They say you ought, say niggas ought to be ashamed to be asking white people to take care of them. In, in that, you, you ought to be ashamed for somebody white to tell you you ought to be ashamed. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. I mean, after 30 years of integration, you haven't learned how to produce jobs for you and your children yet. Your excuse before was segregation. You produce more jobs under segregation. You produce none under integration. You've taken a step backwards produced absolutely none. You were forced to be rich under segregation because you had to support your own people. You didn't support them because you liked it. You just couldn't help yourself. As <laughs> soon as they let you out that ghetto, you went to give them white folk everything you could get your hands on. You only want to raise now so you can give them some more. These white folks don't have enough money right now. <laughs> I need a raise so I can give them some more. <laughs> And don't any of you think I'm against white people. I'm just against you being in poverty. <coughs> yeah, I'm not against white people. I'm just pro you. I don't have any idea in my head about putting white people down. I'm just here to lift you up. Yeah. I have no desire in my heart to put white people out. I'm here to put you in. That's all. In the White House, in a house, in a mansion, whatever, in. Is there anything wrong with that? No, you need somebody to help you get in. <laughs> They're doing everything to keep you out. They don't want you in. I'm not concerned about putting them out. But I have the power to put you in. I'm doing it too.
When it comes to the social part of life, I am society. Yahweh is society. And I discovered that after I moved from poverty to riches, I'm invited to be a part of the highest of society. I have friends in all walks of life, all colors, all nationalities. Some of them have big yachts. Some of them make $25 million a month. They have those great big houses floating on the water. And I go all the time. I found out there was only one thing better than me owning a yacht. That was having friends that own one. Because <laughs> when you have friends that own one, you don't have to pay the note, you don't have to pay the insurance, you don't have to take care of it, you don't have to hire the captain. You just go out on the yacht. And see, when white people pass by, and the government be watching me too, you know, when they all pass by, I'm just captain of the yacht, you know, they think I own it. <laughs> Nobody know the difference. I have on my white, you know, I have a white diadem and white jacket and white pants and white shoes, tennis shoes, you know. And boy, look, they just start waving at me and I wave too. <laughs> but when you get to be rich, then you get to enjoy those kind of friends. So you become society. And when I'm invited to one of their parties, it's not a party like black folk have parties. It's so weird. It's, it's totally different. You know, when you go to a black party, somebody inevitably walks in the door and screams, Yes, it's me! I'm drunk again! <laughs> <laughs> How many heard it? Yeah. There's always some loud mouth coming, right? They're obnoxious, arrogant, overbearing, want to start a fight, want to throw bottles, want to cut somebody, <laughs> right? I mean, they come in a real open and wow, and hit on somebody's wife. You know what I mean, right? I mean, they just get all out of class, just get high, or whatever is high on them. They get high on stuff, sit all in the corner, moody, <laughs> brooding, <laughs> slobbering, <laughs> mumbling. How many have seen those parties? And, and everybody wants to go to one. <laughs> all black folks want to know, where's the party? <laughs> party hearty. Party hard, right? Live for the weekend. That us? When the eagles fly on Friday. Lately, they have just about killed all the eagles. <laughs> well, with the extinction of the eagle, we just don't have paychecks coming in. Anymore. In the meantime, I've gone to several rich white parties on those yachts. Big yachts. Everything you can think, big penthouse, five million dollar condominiums, five million dollar homes. I'm sitting out there and here's 50, 100 white people, Jews. Guess what they're talking about? Money. How to make more money. You must have been to one of them. <laughs> you must have been invited. See, that's sure what they're talking about. See, we can talk. <laughs> <coughs> But you go to black folk, they don't ever talk about making money. They talk about making it with somebody. <laughs> right? They want to make it with somebody, you know. The women there to make it with some man. Man, hey, man, you see that chick over there, boy? She fine. I didn't hear nobody white talking like that. They might have seen something that was fine, but money always was finer. <laughs> it's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. I have, I have personally been at those parties, and I've been a part of a million dollar deal go down. I like those kind of parties. I mean, you get to be a part of a million dollar deal. And then they tell you how to finance it and how you don't need all this money that fools need and stuff. I mean, it's out of sight. And they, it's, and they yeah, you my friend, I'll, I'll, I'll help you. Yeah, you, you. Do you know so-and-so? Well, he's a banker, this one is a lawyer. You need to meet my accountant. I made $25 million last year and I didn't pay no taxes. I just like to make his tax bill. <laughs> you could get rich just paying what would be that taxes. You get all this wisdom, but it's not in school. All the wisdom I hear going down at the parties, none of it was in college. I mean, none of it. You hear me? And all, I, I went to some black parties. <laughs> Teachers, law, whatever. No money talk. No money talk. Everybody want to dance with the lights down low, slow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want no fast music, right? 
Brothers want some slow music with the lights down low. We even make songs about it. Turn the lights down low. <laughs> <laughs> so I can dance slow. I mean, really? <laughs> they spend half their night out there on the floor in the dark with slow music. <laughs> Rapping. <laughs> no money. No money. Black folk go to parties broke, leave broke, and drunk. <laughs> and do what next morning? Can't, can't work with a clear hand. Money is a real drag for black folks, right? But here's all these white people. All I heard was money talk, how to get it. And then they go to work the next week getting it. Because I've been in on it unreal things you hear, how to get this, how to get that, how you do it. How you, you, all you have to do is listen. And you'll find the men are really just basically talking to men. The women sometimes, they talk about the children. You know, that stuff that some women like. To talk about. But the men, shoot, I hang out with the men. Because that sure is where they're talking about getting it. And they get it. You get the point I'm making? that when you actually succeed in moving from poverty to riches, then you move in rich circles. That's what society is about. You move in a circle that is equal to your accomplishments in life. And see, I'm from you. I'm one of you. I went to the schools you went to. I went to Booker T. Washington, too. So why am I getting all this attention? I have a rich reputation. So the rich get richer. And the poor go to their dances <laughs> and their parties and sit around gossiping, yeah. huh? wasting time, being immoral, getting poorer, and then blame everybody for their poor mental state. Yeah. White people even talk to me about niggas. <laughs> I mean, they act like I never was one, you know? And I help them. I say, yeah, the niggas are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> they like that, you know. Yeah, well, niggas are awful, right? right. Yeah, well. <laughs> How many of you admit a nigga is a terrible person? <laughs> How many don't want to be around niggas? <laughs> no, see, even niggas don't want to be around niggas. Y'all might look at me funny. What in the world are you talking about? I am talking about a mindset. Nigga is a mindset. It's a mental attitude. And it's negative. It makes excuses for not accomplishing. I don't have to sit here tonight and teach you about niggas. You've been around them all your life. And they're not fit to be in high-class society. That's why decent people don't want niggas in their midst. You can't blame them. What's niggas going to come to? Turn the party out. <laughs> <laughs> Tear the folks' house down. <laughs> Case the place. Come back and rob it tomorrow. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? So the only way you can move from poverty to riches is get rid of the nigger mindset. <laughs> All this stuff we've been taught in the ghetto and in our homes, we have to let that die and take on a new mind. That's what the Bible means about be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what the Bible means. Cast off the old man. That's the mind. And put on the new mind. That's how you move from poverty. The old mind, the old man is in poverty. Can't you tell? You've been living with this old mind, this old man. He's a poverty stricken fella. He's the man that was laying by the river waiting on somebody to put him in the water. <laughs> it took the son to come by and say, nigga, get up and pick up your own bed and walk. He said, wow, it's shocking. He got up. <laughs> <laughs> See, the Bible is full of the keys. 
but you have people that don't know the Bible talking to you about it. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in. I've already given you a bunch of keys tonight. Not just one. I have given you a number of keys on how to move from poverty to riches already. I've come to establish the perfect moral society of the elite God here. That's what I've come on this earth to do. And every one of you can be that chosen, that elite one, the elect ones. In fact, you are. But you have to be willing to take on a new mindset. How many of you saw the film of my children in, in Yahweh University? Yeah. You see that? Yeah. When every one of our children graduate from Yahweh University, I create a job for them. The 17 that graduated, however, number, however many it was, I think it was 17. The 17 that graduated in March of this year, they all are in management training. Management, they're running stores, they're running businesses. The ones that just graduated in uh, September, we have a graduation every six months. And the second group that graduated for this year are running our hotels right now. They're sitting there as managers. <laughs> and I have decided and concluded that in every single instance where we have a graduate from Yahweh University, that I will create a job for them. They will never have to go around with their resumes. <laughs> public school, they come out the public school filling out a resume. <laughs> and they go knocking on white folks' door saying, and they say, what you want? They say, well, I come, I have my resume here. <laughs> they say, yeah, well, you just resume walking on out there, though. <laughs> they have no idea it's a resume, right? They, that little mark at the end didn't mean anything to them. They had no idea that was French, French right? None of our children have to go through that. I take it as my personal responsibility to create a job for every single one of our children. And it's your responsibility too. When will you join with me and create jobs for our own? Just like everybody else is doing. Now's the time, it's not gonna happen any other way. Strange thing takes place in America when you have white people get together, mother, father, sister, brother, cousin, niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, and other host of relatives. They live 40, 50 to the house, get two jobs apiece, live out of part of one, save all of the other. Then they open up a plant, make money. They find something in the world that people need and they create a plant. They save all their money up to get that. Then they hire themselves, right? As soon as the plant is ready to open, a strange thing takes place in that town a group of people called niggas. Hey, man, see that plant they building out there? Yeah, boy, I see it. I wonder is they high. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go see. Don't they? I heard they opening. Let's go see is they high. <laughs> so they walk in again with another resume. <laughs> I just want to know is y'all hiring? <laughs> White folks say, well, we don't really need anybody right now. We've hired our nieces, nephews, uncles, and cousins, and aunts, and, and other hosts and relatives, so we've really filled all the slots. What the niggas say? Man, they prejudice. <laughs> These doggone crackers, boy. I tell you, man. You know? They just hate us. Why they prejudice? That's discrimination. You crackers ain't high? You ain't gonna have me? Well, we gonna bark at you. We gonna pick at you. We'll teach you. You'll teach those crackers. Come on, man, let's go pick at this joint. We're gonna make them high us. Is that us? Didn't save a nickel. Haven't invested a penny. <laughs> but at 
after they save it and sacrifice and go through hell to get it built, then there you are at the front door, first in line. Why is it and what is keeping you from saving? You and your mother and father, sister, brother, cousin, niece, nephew, uncle, and aunt, and a host of relatives. What's keeping you from saving and providing a service better and cheaper? Why don't you think business with an idea, a product, and a service? We could bring America back. If, since you love America so. Don't tell me that we can't produce steel cheaper than the Japanese build it, uh, use it when they have to get it from America, ship it all the way over to Japan, shape it up into a car, and then pay and ship it back, and then sell it cheaper, and it's better than the American product. At least we got the plants already here. Steel already here. Niggas already unemployed. You can't be worse off. <laughs> What's wrong with us? saving and owning the plant. The whole world would have to buy it from us. No, you want to run around and dictate to white people what they have to do with their money. You want to make white people have to take care of you. Don't you know you should be ashamed in 1990 after over 100 years from slavery, you still in the line begging and dependent like a little child? It's time out for that. How many agree it's time out? It's time to get up. Let's go. Wake up, Lazarus. <laughs> so Yahweh University is an independent school. We publish our own books. We write our own textbooks. We decide and, and determine our own curriculum. So our children come out with high self-esteem. They come out with the idea to just rule everybody. They have no concept in their head about depending on nobody to do anything. Isn't that interesting? It's shocking, isn't it? It's the opposite. My children only come out with the idea of hiring, creating jobs, and hiring somebody. They don't know anything but business. <laughs> They're all like that. All of them are like that. Isn't that something? That tells you something about Yahweh University. I'm proving we must teach our own. We have a perfect learning environment. None of our students have AIDS. That means no faggots in the school. <laughs> That's right. We catch a boy switch and we put a switch on him. <laughs> he straightens right up. There's no syphilis, no gonorrhea, no social diseases. They don't smoke, they don't drink. There's no alcohol, there's no kind of drugs. They're not disrespectful to their elders or to their teachers. We don't have wars and fights in school, no police on the halls. We have perfect, wonderful children in a learning environment, and we have several hundred of them. Isn't that a record? Yeah. Our children ask for books at age two and three, and they turn the books up the right way. They start learning to read at three. We have children in the public schools never learn to read. They still talking about C, 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 Dick, <laughs> and Jane. <laughs> Yahweh University is producing rulers. And they only have an idea of doing the same for their children and our children's children. That means that Yahweh University students are being trained to be the rulers and the producers. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. Now let's look, let's look at, I've given you keys of how to move from poverty to riches spiritually. I've given it to you socially. And I've just given it to you educationally. It's not all I have, it's simply I'm giving you just so many keys in those areas of life. Now I want to give you some keys of how to move from poverty to riches politically. To move from poverty to riches politically, one of the basic keys 
is to have the husband be the Democrat and the wife be the Republican. Or reverse it. It doesn't matter. But one belongs to one party and the other belongs to the other one. I don't believe in either one. I don't believe in being a Democrat or Republican. That's that. I just believe in winning. And when you belong to both parties, then whoever goes to the White House, where are you standing? You standing in the White House with the winner. But they have us in a trick to all be Democrats. Hmm? And when you're all Democrats, so they've just been Republicans for the last three administrations. That leaves you out the house. But the other nation, Jews are smarter than you. It's only five million Jews. How many know Jews just run everything? If you don't know it, they still run it, even if you don't know it. <laughs> They don't care whether you know it or don't know it. They just run it. And how many know Jews are just known to be in business? They're going to sell you something. Do you understand that? So how many know Jews are rich? Why are they rich? They selling you something. Sell somebody. What do you do? All the buying. All of the buying. Jews support the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. 54% of the Democratic money come from Jewish PACs. 63% of the Republican money come from Jewish PACs. So when the Jews say, I want this, he gets it. You over in the Democratic Party and don't have a PAC. It's just a pack of us in there by ourselves, individually. <laughs> That's the way to have poverty. You get that key? How many understand that? That's a heavy key. It's 60 million black folk in America. If 30 million of us are Democrats and 30 million of us are Republicans, we win big, especially when we're family. I tied this to family. Husband one, wife the other. Girlfriend one, boyfriend the other. We're not worried about which one. We're just going to win, son. We almost won with Jesse, and we were not united. Don't you think it's time to just come together? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know that. I'm providing that opportunity. The next thing politically is how many of you would like to take the country over and rule it politically? Be the ruler, run the whole show. Instead of paying out all the taxes, you'd like to be running the tax money <laughs> for a change. Would you like to be able to do that? You would? How many of you would like to take over America and rule the world without a revolution and fight, war, physical, no physical pain? You'd like that? I'm going to give you the key right now. You got to sit on the edge of your seat, though. You can't sit back for this one. <laughs> this is hot. You ready? See, to rule, it's 60 million black folk in America. <coughs> All you have to do is have 10 babies each. <laughs> No, get in here. You invite your husband, come on, get in here. <laughs> so he's trying to tell the husband already, get out of here. You better tell this man, come on, get in here, and let's have 10 babies. <laughs> that would give us 600 million children. That's how the Cubans took over Florida. That's how the Cubans took over Miami. Hialeah has the highest birth rate in the country. They have more Cuban babies than anybody in the world. They don't know what birth control. They don't let nobody give them birth control. They don't use no rubber, no, no, no douche, no, no uh, jelly, what those things, nor forms or core forms, all, all that stuff. Y'all know what I'm, y'all know what it is. They, they don't use none of that. And their baby just grow up and vote Cuban. <laughs> If we're going to be niggas, we, we need 600, of those little, 600 million of those little fellas that grow up and just vote nigger. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you don't think you can take over without firing a shot, let me give you another piece on that. When, when, when you tell one of your 10, say, baby, 
moving that block right there. Yeah. What are they going to do? Yeah. They're going to move. Yeah. See, so all, all 600 million of us have to do is pick our block. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> have I put out in, and they all move, right? Uh -huh. Then we take over 600 million blocks. White folk will be backstroking, trying to get to Europe, <laughs> swimming. <laughs> Now, now that might sound like, ooh, get out of here. No, no. See, how many of you believe in the Bible? Well, when you say get out of here, you're denying the power of the Bible. Oh, what did God say in the Bible in Genesis? Be fruitful and multiply. And you want to tell God, uh-uh. You want to have fun with God's creation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to cut the fun off. No. All y'all that don't want, baby, you don't want you don't want to cut that fun out. You want to let all that stay there. And then don't do what God said to. So then you're under a curse. Babies are a blessing, or He wouldn't have told us be fruitful. Cause see, in that same scripture, it's a lot of knowledge. It says, be fruitful and multiply. That's not all. It says, and then go out and subdue the earth. Take over the earth. That's what it says. There are hundreds of millions of acres of land with nobody living on it in America. They got you crowded all up in the city, crowded up in the ghetto, and it does seem like it's crowded. If you put a bunch of rats in a crowded condition, they start fighting each other. So when you put a bunch of niggas in the same room, they start fighting each other, eating each other, black on black crime. You want to know what's wrong with niggas? They too crowded up. Niggas need room. <laughs> you need some air. It's in here, the country full of it. Oh, I'm telling you the keys. How many see? I'm giving you the keys. Where are, they, where are the keys coming from? From the Bible. Stop fighting God and accept your prosperity. If it wasn't for God, niggas would be all gone in 10 more years. Wouldn't be no more niggas in America. They done cut you up from everything. You done cut your tubes out, cut your broom out, taking tubal ligations and, 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 and every kind of pill and stuff you can take. And niggas just don't have children anymore. The people that can't afford children are the ones got them. And all you that's got money, y'all have 2.1 kids. 2.2. <laughs> so that, that point is just crawling around. I don't know what that is. <laughs> You the one make you in here. You make the most money, got the best education, huh? And then come up with no kids. What sense does that make? You the one that need all the kids, so you can teach them some sense, so we can subdue the earth, like God said to. Subdue it, subdue it. Don't you know that's prosperity? Got 600 people, family, trading with each other, doing business together. And we, we got so many in, our, in this country, we move, uh, you know, 100 million in South America, and 100 million over here in another country, and another 100. We just move out like they move out. And then we start trading with each other from land to land as family. That ain't nothing but money. Oh, I'm giving it to you straight from the Bible. I'm giving you prosperity, keys. And you've been going to church all your life, and they don't teach you that. It's right in the book. I'm not making it up. I'm just giving it to you because Yahweh, my father, gave it to me to give it to you. You can't buy what I'm telling you. What price do you put on this? I'm teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Yahweh, and of his Son, Yahweh, the Yahweh, and of his holy word, which was God from the beginning. I bless all good people, regardless of their race, creed, or color, in the name of Yahweh, the creator. And I'm born as a gift to all good people of the planet Earth. I have established the government of Yahweh and the nation of Yahweh. My words are designed to sift the nations 
and cause the glorious voice of Yahweh to be heard among all the people of the earth. And you can look at world events and see that the time of wicked rule is now fulfilled and the kingdom of Yahweh is near. See, when the kingdom, when the rulership of evil people comes to an end, then another rulership has to take its place. It has to be the opposite. So the good kingdom is coming, and that's the good news that I bring. I have a divine message to America. Yahweh says, let my people go. The government of Yahweh has no end. Of the increase of my government and peace, there shall be no end. My name, Yahweh ben Yahweh, is a sign. Behold, the virgin. Who is the virgin? The virgin is the so-called black man of America. You mean? Yeah. The so-called black man of America is the virgin of the Bible. And you have produced an immaculate conception, the son of Yahweh. The Immaculate Conception means that you didn't personally design me. You didn't personally call me forth. You can't account for my birth. Yet I'm here as the son of Yahweh giving you the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding which will move you from a people without mercy to a people with mercy. I moved you from a condition to being the rejected and the despised to being the accepted and the eulogized and the ones held in high esteem. I've come and I'm able to take you from poverty and move you to riches. I'm doing that for all who follow my teaching. I'm doing that. So I am the one from you, and you are the virgin. Now, you think of virgin, and you have to study these words, but you normally think of virgin as someone who's never had a man. Well, you as a people have never had a man in your midst these 435 years in America. I'm the first man born among you. Absolute man. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. And when I say man, understand me, I'm not saying male. Once again, you have to learn words. And when you study words, you find out that man means mind. And I'm the first divine mind born among you in your history. The first one. That makes me the first begotten of the dead because no school taught me what I'm teaching you. No school taught me to do what I'm doing. I'm the first man born among you that have built something from nothing. I have established the nation of Yahweh without a precedent and without a teacher, except I tell you who my teacher is. You can't account for what I'm doing from the teachings of men. That makes me unique. So how did I come to know Yahweh? I'm self-raised. I'm not raised by another man. No other man reached in with the lion's paw and raised me up to make me perpendicular to the square. Yet I'm the only one that has the lion's grip and the master's word. Yet no man has taught me. How can you account, account for my knowledge? I carry 360 degrees. All that man can raise you is 33. He can't raise you 33. <laughs> he claimed to raise you 32. The th other one is honorary. You're not really raised, but I'm not down in that. I'm talking about I have 360, and it can prove it. That means I can try you, but you can't try me. <laughs> There's no question that you can form in your head that I cannot answer but I can form questions you've never considered. I've done it all night tonight. So you can't account for me except that I'm an immaculate conception. Immaculate. I'm the seed of God. I'm the seed of the Father. That's why I'm self-realized, self-taught, self-raised. I'm self-proclaimed. And when white people write about me, they will say in their writing, Yahweh ben Yahweh, the self-proclaimed son of God. They know who I am. They don't deny it. So what makes you a virgin 
is your virgin from several points of view. One, you've never had a man born among your midst, out of your midst before. So you're, that makes you a virgin. That's not all that a virgin is. You need to have a synonym finder, study the word virgin, and you will discover that in its definitions, it says that a virgin is someone who can have the wool pulled over their eyes. They can be hoodwinked. <laughs> they easily deceive people. They are gullible people. Huh? They easily fool. They easily taken advantage of. Anyone can come in their neighborhoods and get rich from them and they can't get rich from themselves. Oh, that's a definition of virgin. So everything that's negative is also a virgin. You've never been taught what I'm saying. Study it. Study it. So you, the so-called black people of America, you are the virgin. And you've produced God in the flesh. And I'm not here to simply stand as God in the flesh, but I'm here to cause you, every one of you, to become the sons of God. Every single one of you. You have that opportunity. So my words are designed to sift the nations and cause the glorious voice of Yahweh to be heard. And Yahweh will bless them that bless me and curse them that curse me. All power is given unto me in the heavens and in the earth. And I'm teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father Yahweh and of his Son Yahweh ben Yahweh and of the Holy Word of Yahweh, which was God from the beginning. And that's all that I speak to you. You can look at world events and see that as the wicked is coming to an end, I'm building. I'm going all across America, and every time I go across America, I speak to three types of people, conscious, unconscious, and the dead. These are three mindsets. I speak to the conscious mindset, the unconscious mindset, and the mentally dead. Those three people are in this audience tonight. Those three types of people are sitting in here now. And you know how the dead mindset is. He doesn't move on his own. He's like a man dead in a funeral home. If you see him in one room today and you see him in another room tomorrow, what do you know happened? Somebody moved. <laughs> he does not respond to stimuli, cold, heat, light. Huh? He responds to no words. Nothing. He's dead. That's the way my people are. They don't respond to nothing. They just wise to do evil. To do good, they have no knowledge and no understanding. That's the unconscious, the dead man, excuse me. And at the end of my... Uh, speaking to you tonight, the dead man will just be unmoved. Yeah. <laughs> well, what did Yahweh Ben Yahweh teach? <coughs> well, did, did, he, did, did he teach on uh, how to move from poverty to riches? <laughs> <laughs> just dead. Just, well, what you going to do? <laughs> What, what, did you even like the man? <laughs> they look at you with those old wild looks, man. Yahweh told me about those kind of folks when I came. He told me in Ezekiel. He said, don't, don't be afraid of them, Yahweh. Yahweh. They look so mean. They were scared. They scared dead man to death. <laughs> but don't you worry about them. <laughs> yeah, but have you, how many admit my people can look mean? Yeah. You seen them? I mean, scare a dead man to death. <laughs> Make a man die twice. They don't care nothing about what I say, and nobody else either. Dead folks. Then there's an unconscious mind set in here. The unconscious mind, they respond to stimuli. You know, you can stick them, they holler. They get hot, they sweat. Put them in a cold room, chill bump, break out. You open the unconscious man, his eyes, he'll re the eyes will react to light. He may even carry on a conversation. He no, don't remember it. <laughs> may get up and walk. A zombie walk for you. Don't know where he been. So at the end of my lecture, he'll come up. He'll say, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> can't touch this. <laughs> you touch my head. Mm, can't touch this. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> he's unconscious. You don't know what he's saying. <laughs> then he'll tell you, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, we should go to work together. <laughs> I'm doing similar thing. Yeah, we ought to work together. I'm doing something similar to you. Really? He's unconscious. So the only man that's really going to truly benefit tonight is the conscious mind. And the conscious mind understands everything I've said, understands every key that I have given, understands that there's not anything for nothing in this world. He has to make some action, give up some time, give up some commitment. They know all that. They understand full well that if we're ever going to have freedom and justice and superiority, that we're going to have to put down some work and make some sacrifices and work together regardless of what it is. The conscious mind is going to be ready to do something about it and join hands with me tonight. Watch and see. It's going to happen. Nobody can stop us from coming together. My meeting is really calling for the conscious. <laughs> Now don't you say I'm with you. <laughs> I shall save the so-called blacks of America from breaking the laws of Yahweh. America, Yahweh is the creator of all things seen and unseen. You might say, America? I don't see nobody in here, but really, black folks, what you talking about America? America's not in this room. You're not on national TV. But let me tell you something. <coughs> There's no way in the world that I can travel around America teaching you what's not taught in the public schools and be ignored by the United States government. There's no way that I can come and teach you how to move from poverty to riches when the church teaches you to get it when you die. That's why the U.S. government allows the church tax freedom, a tax break freedom. Preacher can get all he wants, pay no taxes, because he's teaching you not to be a competitor in the now. Just take your little bit, whatever you can get your little hands on, and be satisfied, and look for something when you die. So the government subsidizes that kind of teaching and rewards it. That's why the preacher is so protective in holding his church and trying to keep you from hearing me too. See, the preacher spend more time trying to get you not to hear me than white folks do. But if you think white people in the government are happy about me coming around teaching you how to move, because they, they take that as when you learn how to do this for yourself, then they can't sell it to you because you're going to be selling it to yourself. That's going to take money from their pocket. So they're not happy with me teaching you. How many understand? Yes, sir. Right. See, why did they want to kill the man 1,900 years ago? He hurt the economy. <coughs> hmm? Yeah, yeah. See, the man you call Jesus hurt the economy. So all the rich had to kill him, and they did. Why? You don't understand? See, you don't know nothing about the Bible. I have to tell you what, what my father told me to tell you about this. You want to hear? I got to hurry up and quit the time. I don't want to quit, but the time say I got to quit. But let me tell you what this means. The man 1,900 years ago put the hospitals out of business. He put the doctors out of business. He put the nurses out of business. He put the insurance companies out of business. He put the lawyers out of business. None of them could make any money on sickness, because he healed the sick. And a man that go around and heal all the sick is not loved by doctors, <laughs> lawyers, nurses, right? That's, a, that's the biggest business in America, sickness. You don't learn how to be healthy in America. They don't teach you true health in the schools. They teach you to eat everything, things that kill you. And doctors don't tell you what won't kill you. He take you off a little bit of stuff, and then you feel better, and he come back, come back next week. Well, if you got me well, what I'm coming back next week for? 
he keep me coming back, giving up money. So if a man is in the land healing the sick, he makes a lot of people unhappy, doesn't he? Who runs the country? People in business. Is that who runs the country? People in business. Who do you work for? People in business. The man 1900 years ago, he made every funeral home mad. Everybody selling graves and caskets and hearse. All of them went out of business. General Motors was hurt. No more hearses. No more limousines for dead bodies. Huh? The workers are mad because they can't make no more extra hearses for all these dying niggas. The man was what? Raising the dead. What? Raising the dead. Raising the dead. That's not all. He put the grocery stores out of business. The supermarkets went broke. People exploiting in the farms went broke. People in the trucking business shipping all that stuff around went broke. Because this man, he fed thousands from three little fish and five loaves of bread. 5,000 people. You don't want no man like that in America today, would they? Look at how many enemies. And you believe he's coming back. What do you think he's coming back to do? Kill you? Bury you? Make you sick? They killed him last time for doing these things for you. And then you didn't have no decent houses to live in. 1900 years ago, no decent housing. What did he say? In my father's house are many, what? Mansions. You're not living in mansions now, so one coming back, what's he going to have to do? Put you in mansions. You getting it? Anybody getting it? <laughs> You getting the picture? <laughs> so the one 1900 years ago was moving people from poverty and sickness, from poverty to riches, from sickness to health, from death to life, from hunger to full. He gave people peace of mind. Psychiatrists out of business. Psychologists out of business. Mental sick homes are gone. Because he healed the people's mind. So if this man is prophesied to come back, what in the world do you think he's going to do? Got to do the same thing or he'll be another kind of man. They killed him the last time. And when he went to trial, you joined those who mocked him. Hmm? You had a choice of taking a thief or take the one that was doing all these things for you. You joined the crowd last time and said crucify him. Wow. Oh yeah, you did it. <laughs> you did it. You the descendants of those who did it. You did it. How many have been wanting to see him come back? What you gonna do this time? <laughs> Crucify me again? Huh? When the enemy called for me this time, what you gonna do? Let him have me? Or are you gonna protect him? He come for power this time. How long? And to give it to who? You who been poor. The meek, huh? It's your time to inherit what? Not heaven. But what? Yes. See, somebody been lying to you talking about going to heaven. You, he come back for you to inherit what? Yes. It's written in the book. Inherit the earth. Where are you living? Yes. Why haven't you been taught the earth is your inheritance? Why haven't you been taught 
how to inherit it. Why haven't you been given the keys which allows you to take it? I gave you one key, you laughed at it. Have babies. Take the sucker. Take the earth with babies. Instead of being on birth control, see, as long as you're under control of other people, they control your birth, you'll never take control. You'll never subdue it. The government pays out all the money they want to pay out to keep all the birth control clinic in what community? In the black community who is destined to inherit the earth. And instead of being taught how to subdue it, you've been taught how to be under control. The one 1900 years ago didn't say kill babies. He said, suffer little children to come unto me. How can you have little children come unto me and you killing them all? You refusing to have any. And you talking about you want him to come back? What do you think he's going to tell you when he comes back? Where are my babies? Where are my children? But you don't want to suffer having them so they can come to me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And you want to go to heaven? Heaven is on the earth. You're not going there without children. God has little babies having babies, and you are against that. Kids having kids. But when kids having kids, there wouldn't be no niggas left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've been taught tonight. I said, you've been given some keys tonight, children. Yes, <laughs> and tell me I made it up. Come on. Tell me I made all this up. Where is it coming from? If you don't know it's coming from the Bible, you just don't know the Bible. I sound like a radical, don't I? Don't I? They accuse me of being a militant. Well, then that's what the son must have been because the government was against it. How many of you understand by your nature the government has to be against it? That means the FBI is listening tonight. This room is bugged. They subpoenaed my itinerary of where I would travel for six, these next six weeks. They had every place. They meet me at the airport. They follow me into the town. They follow me to the wherever I go. They just all around, cars everywhere. I don't give a hoot about crackers. <laughs> what they do. And if one of you in here is an FBI agent for them or an informant for them, welcome. Because <laughs> you nor your boss can do a thing about what I'm teaching. It comes from the creator, Yahweh, and he's in charge of everything. And there's nothing any man can do about that. And I have no fear of a man. I just want you to know, I know they're running all around, following and listening and watching you, and they don't want you to hear this. And that's why the numbers are small. I'm not interested in putting pictures out all over the buildings, all over the cities, and trying to have hundreds of thousands present. I'm satisfied to fulfill the word. The word says that you will come to me one by one. So if only one of you come to me tonight, I'm satisfied. I'm fulfilling the word one by one. I'm teaching the straight gate. I'm teaching the straight highway. And it's only a few that can find it. But the way to hell is broad. Plenty there are that be on it. And there are leaders that can get 10, 20, 30,000 together in a room and take you all to hell. <laughs> That's where you're headed. If you don't know what hell is, it's on earth, it's right here, it's in America. It's, it's going on. They don't have nothing to take you to. But this is what I'm teaching. Can't you tell it's straight? And see, when people see there's something straight on the line, they start saying, well, I don't know if I'm that straight. Uh, I, I'm not quite ready. Uh, I'm not quite ready to get my life in order. Uh, I can tell that what Yahweh bin Yahweh is teaching is right, but I'm not quite ready for the truth yet. Uh, well, you know, uh, excuse, 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 excuse. I kinda, I'm kind of used to the poverty I'm in. I, 
America, I plead with you to let my people go. Divine justice requires you to deal wisely with my people, lest it come to pass when there comes a war and they join on to your enemies and fight against you. So let my people return to their king, Yahweh. America, you're holding my people in poverty after 435 years of physical, mental, and spiritual slavery. America, you have set over my people tough taskmasters to afflict them with terrible burdens. We have built the great cities of America with our free slave labor, of which we have never been paid. We worked 310 long years, free from sun up to sundown, 12 hours a day, never been paid. They paid the Japanese just for taking them and putting them in prison for, you know, two or three years. We've never been paid. How many think it's time for us to get paid? Yeah. There you go. And for you that didn't raise your hand, I'm going to take your part. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. It won't do you any good to get it as individualists. <laughs> America, you have been our teachers for 435 years, and you are now greed because of your product. You continue to make the lives of my people bitter with hard bondage in America. And in all manner of service and in all fields of work, my people suffer prejudice on their job. They suffer discrimination on their jobs, and they discover they suffer hatred on their jobs. How many of you have been going through that kind of thing, and you've seen our people going through it? America, you have used your science to destroy and murder all of our unborn children through abortion and evil birth control methods. But again, you always outsmarted you by having babies have babies to keep our people alive in America. Remember, America, that our mothers fear God. Our people are fruitful and have increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty. And America is filled with my people, 60 million strong. America, you have planned in secret to overrun our community with drugs and now hold over one million of our sons in your prisons who fell for your trap, all between the ages of 17 and 25. After you failed to provide jobs for millions more of our sons besides the one you have in jail, the only economy you provide is for them to sell your drugs in order to live. And then you bust our sons who fall for your traps while your rich distributors with their planes and boats go free. America, let my people go. America, in addition to the poverty of my people, you have over 15 million homeless, unemployed people living in poverty in this great land of opportunity. And taxes are killing the great businessmen of this country. America, Yahweh has raised me up to move the world from poverty to riches and to peace eternally. And to my people in America, Yahweh, the great I am, the God of your fathers has sent me to you first to raise you from the bottom to the top from poverty to riches, I am has sent me unto you. The Lord Yahweh, God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. And Yahweh is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is here in your midst and sees everything that is being done to you here in America. And I will bring you up out of America, out of poverty, to great riches. America, Yahweh, the God of the so-called black man of America, has met with us. And now, let us go. Uh, we urgently appeal to you. Let my people come to me without hindrance. And if the government of America will not let you come to me, then Yahweh will stretch out his hand mightily and smite America with all the wonders which you are beginning to see in her midst now. For you who want to know about the war impending 